I'll make your presentation wow with Canva. You can amaze the crowd. Wanna brainstorm? Put your pencils down. Online whiteboards, ideas all around. Woo! Coming in hot with a Canva doc. Docs and decks, I like it a lot. Design a website quick in minutes. Give the videos too. One stop shop. You can design with ease. Print with free delivery. Make your work feel like a breeze. Beautiful templates, yes please. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can get the job done. Play and have fun. What you design today at Canva.com. The next session will begin in 20 seconds. Welcome to our next to last session, day six, week of AI. It is Friday, and we are so Friday. happy you decided to join us. I'm Amanda Fox, and this is Erica Sandstrom, Green Screen Gal, and I'm so glad I have my presentations over. <laughs> but wait to <laughs> see this amazing presenter, and especially his outfits. He is the real deal. He is. He, he cyberpunked it up for us. He got all dressed up. Um, super stoked. Um, did you want me to introduce him or? Sure. Go ahead. My two All sisters. Right. <laughs> so Jonathan Nalder is from Brisbane, Australia. So he's technically reporting from the future. It is uh, Saturday over there. And I had the pleasure of meeting Jonathan in Carlsbad, California for Q Spring. Gosh, back in 2000, pre-COVID days. What was it? 2000, 2019, 18 or 19. So through 23 to the, through 23 years in education, Jonathan, the edge you not, has been at the bleeding edge of learning how digital tools, STEM, AR, VR, AI, environment sensors, and a focus on our humanity can boost the success of students everywhere. He's also learned by working with luminaries such as Ruben uh, Pintadura, um, SAMR, Dr. Larry Johnson, NMC, and Professor Stephen Heppel, uh, Learnometer, the Future We community, and this current role, or his current role, as Chief Futures Officer at STEM Punks, how tools alone are not enough, but must be combined with future thinking to truly transform lives. You can connect with him on Twitter at uh, JinxyZ, at J-N-X-Y-Z. So we're going to go ahead and bring him up. Hey. Hello, hello. <laughs> hey, guys. Now you you've got to kind of do do the fashion show off. We got to see this jacket. Uh, yeah. So I mean, when when I see the colors, you know, all the the logos and stuff you, that you guys have designed and been using for the week, I had to go a little bit cyberpunk for my session, uh, especially you know, liven things up as you get towards the end of the huge week. Yeah, yeah. So I just said I uh, greetings from. Well, you didn't, you didn't buy Thanks that. You guys. Just, yeah. You didn't buy that. You just had that in your closet. Uh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> that makes me adore you even more. <laughs> but um it matched right so yeah it had to happen dr harves out there um on the other side of the ditch as we call it and the in my, my part of the world as well any other any other aussies uh He's yeah we're in a good mood today. saturday morning but hi to everyone uh in friday as well nice awesome Yep, he I says good day. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know Michael, Dr. Michael Harvey, he's in New Zealand. He is a Kiwi, um, pretty phenomenal educator. He's doing amazing things with AI uh, as well. So definitely check him out on social. So yeah, and I um, love your I loved your pronunciation, uh, Amanda, of um, my Twitter handle. You got there in the end, the at J N X Y Z. It kind of, I mean, how do you pronounce J N X Y Z? It probably is jin Jinxie. So jinxie. I love that. Jinxies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thinking of yeah. I, I thought I'd probably, I should probably spell it for people, but we'll put that in the chat. <laughs> follow him. Well. Um, make sure you follow him on Twitter or on social. 
He's got great content that he's always putting out. Um, he got he had a great graphic on design thinking and AI, the workflow and the processes and different tools. Ooh, so <laughs> And okay. that's also a preview for what we're talking about today. <laughs> yeah. All right. So are you I ready? Jacket. I want that. <laughs> yeah. Want that yeah. I'll, I'll set to go. Oh, all right. Sure. Thanks, guys. We, um, we need a cyberpunk in person conference where we get all you know retro wow, futuristic. Yeah. We pass yeah. out glow sticks that go with the badges. Like I think it needs to happen. Yeah. Next year. Worlds, <laughs> 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 Amanda. Week of AI. <laughs> I'm the person you don't want to watch a show with that I've already seen. <laughs> so, um, all right. So we're gonna pop down. And we're gonna go down under. But <laughs> let you let you oh. present. <laughs> oh, okay. cheesy. we're so cheesy. All right. Thank you, guys. But um, listen, it's probably a good point to say also thanks so much to the Week of AI crew, um, not just for all the amazing sessions and the people you brought together, but you know, you've been there for every session as well, hosting and uh, introducing us. Uh, it's been, yeah, fantastic. Now, um, yeah, what am I here to talk about? Uh, this a little bit coming from that human perspective, uh, as you can see, and yeah, I want to talk about STEM design thinking tips. Um, yeah, so that's uh, me, Jonathan, the Edgenaut, and I tend to think of the idea of an Edgenaut there's probably a bunch of you out there listening. You probably are edgenauts, maybe without knowing it. It's a it's an adventurous educator, someone who's willing to explore new things, which is probably what you're doing if you're also trying out all of our AI tools. Um, so yeah, it's been a, a huge week. I've been able to come into uh, four or five sessions. Uh, no doubt you've already learned a lot, and I probably have this little bit of a problem of maybe everything's already been said. <laughs> In the, in the previous week, but we'll, we'll see. I'm hoping to bring some new perspectives. I did um, I did check out John Wick's session and got to Hi, make... I'm Jonathan, the Edunaut, and I'm all set for the week of AI. Got to make uh, my digital AI come to life. Um, so maybe that's something that you tried out during the week. Um, hopefully that stacks of those uh, kind of things come along. But even in the week that we have, the, the sort of the conference has been going on, there's been a bunch of huge announcements um, and this is <laughs> kind of where AI is at uh, at the moment um, yeah, every day almost every week there's a whole bunch of new stuff so even just this week we've had uh, chat GPT has released their mobile app um, so that you can <laughs> easily take take all that power around uh, with you anyway there are now plugins for chat GPT as well so it can access the current internet as well as a bunch of other things uh, Google's version uh, called Bard is now in wide release. Uh, if you're in the US, maybe you want to visit a Wendy's, you might run into an AI that's doing all the ordering over there now. Uh, and Google uh, has released its music LM at a, at a wide release as well. I had a bit of a play with that after registering to create little 15 second music clips of pretty much anything. So yeah, it's been a, a, a huge week, even like just since our presenter started talking, there's all these uh, new things that have uh, come out. Um, so... I want to give you a quick little preview. This is where we're kind of going to end up by the end of my session. We want to be talking about design thinking and all the tools that you can plug in using that design thinking, the idea of STEM lessons as our framework for basing our discussion and et cetera around. But before we do that, it's always really important for me to talk about, hang on, not the tech, uh, but our, what are our learning goals? So I just wanted everyone watching, listening, just take that minute. Um, and I do this because um, I, it's been a problem for me in the past. I openly admit I'm one of those early adopters and I'll be like, oh, cool new tech, shiny toys, um, and off I go. And look, we actually need that. And this conference is very important in that respect. We need especially educators, teachers who are testing, trying out these new tools for everyone else course there's that danger that you focus only on the technology um, and so we we'll just take a quick little minute to think about what learning goals like it might actually be something personally that's your personal philosophy for learning uh, I know for me um, I was a learning difficulties teacher for many years before I pivoted to technology and training teachers with technology and the idea of helping every student become an independent learner was really important for me that they weren't just relying on me as the teacher to give them their scaffolded program, that they had some skills that they could fall back on themselves. But for you, your classroom right now, I'm wondering what 
that goal might be. And once you've got that in mind, then you can choose the tools that are most relevant. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit easy to get overwhelmed as well, especially with all these new AI tools, having the time even to try them out. But if you've got that specific little goal ready to go, um, that can make a big difference as well. And in the STEM learning that I do now working with STEM punks, who we'll tell you more about uh, in a bit, um, the idea we want to give kids that chance to be able to combine areas of learning, the science, technology, engineering, maths, but also designing and arts. We want to be able to combine those together to solve real world problems. And that's what will then guide. So if a tool can't help me do that in my lessons, that's fine. I can just leave that one out, focus on the other ones. Okay, so... Having said that, what are we going to cover across? We want to start off talking about, okay, well, where have we been technology-wise um, and even history-wise? Uh, and this is, if you, if you didn't already guess from me grabbing a cyberpunk jacket that I have a drama teacher background, um, once I get into this first little section, you probably might be able to pick out that I was also a history teacher. So I want to talk about, yeah, where have we been? We we'll talk about, okay, well, where are we at? What's this current state with AI? Um, and then move on to talk about integration examples for these different tools. And I just had to share this classic <laughs> math teachers who were protesting against calculators. Um, and there's actually been a fascinating history of pretty much any new kind of technology. Um, you can guarantee it's, it's always been banned somewhere uh, in, in the world when it first appears, uh, including Google search as well as the big one back when I was sort of um, just starting my university uh, teaching degrees, etc. Um, and then, you know, we, we figure out ways to deal with these uh, and uh, move on and integrate. But we are at that interesting stage. And I will talk about some of the issues around AI, especially in schools. Okay, so where have we been? Uh, cast our minds way back to a pre-industrial era. So that could be uh, it's a huge amount of history there, obviously, um, sort of pre the sort of 1700s, 1800s. Um, and for most of that time, humans, if we were doing work, our jobs somehow pretty much would have been physical of some, some kind, whether working with your hands, I mean, the classic hunter and gathering, but only a very small percentage of your population would have been what was considered literate um, at that time, able to record symbols or, you know, reading, writing, uh, etc. And look, most humans, most of human history, that was, that was pretty normal. Uh, that's how it lived. Then we had this industrial revolution. Um, and I'm um, uh, completely oversimplifying this, of course, but this was sort of a time where machines, and we had steam power that uh, initially enabled this, later on electricity, uh, but we could actually replace that for most of that physical labor. It's never all, but most of that physical labor um, with machines. So... If all the human history we'd previously pretty much done physical things um, as our method of work, um, there had to be a shift. And the shift that we saw from that time was humans where our work moved to being a mental labour. Uh, and a huge part of that, naturally, uh, was the development of mass education. Um, now, hey, if you want everyone to be literate and numerate and be able to do uh, mental labour as their jobs, we needed that mass education schooling system. Um, and here we are today as teachers um, at a far, sort of far, far end of that journey, I guess, where it's not just literacy and numeracy. Um, there are many, many other things in our curriculum, of course, now to prepare people to participate uh, in the modern world. And look, having that mass education, the ability for everyone to be able to read, write, uh, be numerate, communicate is what has made our modern world possible, uh, being able to communicate across the world collaborate etc um yeah it's all because of that that phase um where are we now though we start talking about um uh, maybe there's a new era after this industrial revolution that we're coming into and there's a few, few different i guess types of ai so i want to take a, a little bit of time just spell out some of these things a little bit um it's very easy just to say ai and then chat gpt um it's probably worthwhile spending a little bit of time just looking, defining those uh, before we get into the next part of our discussion. So for, uh, for quite a long time, we've had what you might call narrow AI. I mean, autocorrect is something we've been all been using for years. 
Um, and, uh, you know, even things like Microsoft Word, et cetera, where our, our spelling gets highlighted. There are some versions of very little kinds of automatic processing um, that it's been there helping us out for a while. And narrow II can also extend even to things like uh, projects around self-driving cars. Now, this is a, a type of artificial intelligence, machine learning process that's being built, but it's really doing pretty much one job. It's aiming to do one job really, really well. So your self-driving car is not going to um, you know, make your breakfast or clean your kitchen or help you with your homework. It's, an, it's focused very much on that. And so those, those um, efforts have been uh, around for quite a while. Um, then we move into the phase where, again, this is oversimplifying, but from how I see it, we're moving to this generative AI era now where the models, so the amount of data that are being fed into uh, the machine learning and the AI models has grown to a stage now where, yep, the AI can start to be self-generating. And it's the generative AI. Beyond us, uh, at some point, <laughs> will be future progress uh, towards an artificial general intelligence. And that could be the type of AI that can drive your car uh, and mix up you know, new recipes and cook, cook your meals and help you with your homework and be that, that sort of general AI that we might have all seen in, in movies where... Uh, yep, and AI then becomes smarter than humans and, yeah, some uh, amazing new future starts. But we're kind of, uh, yeah, at that generative AI kind of phase now. Um, let's have a bit of a think about this phase then. There's a few little things I wanted to share. Um, there's this fascinating idea now that we're all living in this reality where no human has actually beaten a computer in chess uh, for over 15 years. It just hasn't happened. Um, and... And then maybe, I really hope that there is a bunch of educators, teachers who are way younger than me, uh, who are in our audience uh, today. But um, yeah, for, you know, someone who's, sort of, I might say, mid-career, this idea of, oh, wow, like we live in an era where like it just hasn't happened for 15 years. But there's this other interesting side, I want you to think about sort of the human side as well, where still, despite that, it's not like everyone's going, oh, stuff it, we'll give up on chess, um, that, you know. That's it. Um, actually, it's it's a more popular game than ever uh, at the moment. Okay. Also, uh, where are we at as far as generative AI? Yep. Pretty rapid developments, uh, as we've discussed. So Mid Journey is a image generator tool, one of the sort of well-known ones. And it's just fascinating looking at the change from uh, version one, not great, uh, all the way up to version five in less than two years. And I'm pretty sure that Version 6, someone in the comments might be able to um, correct me, but I think version 6 is uh, just being released or is imminent as well. Now, along those lines of that, this sort of the image generation, and that's probably, that's probably a place where a lot of us maybe got started with learning about um, generative AI is the making images. So if you have not ever gone to whichfacesreal.com, uh, I want you to take a second now just to visit this site and try and click on the image who you think is real, which person uh, is real. Let me see if it'll work for me to switch to that for you guys to be able to see. Uh, so this is the one. Now, these images didn't exist um, or the fake one didn't exist until I loaded this web page. It's completely generating this and I need to click on the one that is real, left or right. I have it. I've got to admit, obviously, I've played this one quite a few times. Um, one reason I'm showing it to everyone today is this is a great one for your, your staff back at school if you want to get them discussing and talking about and just trying out some generative AI for themselves. Um, look, I'm going to click on this one. Uh, so, I yes, I was successful. I was clicked on now. I wonder which one you guys thought. Now, the one I clicked on is a bit kind of, uh, not pixelated, um, it was, it's sort of a low resolution. So it might've been easy to think that this one was the fake one. Uh, if we just quickly play again, you'll see it generate some new ones. Uh, oh, this one I think is actually a little bit easier. And if you've been looking at generated images for a while, uh, you might be able to tell a bit easier. Uh, the bigger your screen as well, the easier it is uh, to guess. Sometimes the computer generated ones will still have weird little artifacts and mashed up bits. And I think, yep, that was the fake one. All right, so that's definitely one, as I said, I recommend uh, play around with, uh, show it to other people that you can get some really fun, interesting, interactive 
uh, discussions going around that site. But th this is the point where I tell you uh, that that website, it's actually about four or five years old. Uh, so if you can imagine how far that generative technology has come since then, um, yeah. So that's all. Uh, save that point. If you're showing it to staff as well, let them have a play for a while and then hit them with, yep, this is actually a really, really old example of this kind of technology. Um, something else I thought was uh, worth showing, you may have seen this a little while ago about students that <laughs> got ChatGPT to write their homework uh, and then they were able to get a 3D printer and a pen set up that actually hand wrote what ChatGPT is. So you can um, find that on Facebook if you look up. 3D printer does my homework that ChatGPT wrote. Um, you can actually find the video um, to that. That's another good, quite fun one to show fellow teachers. Um, a lot of work, creative work, um, STEM, STEM work even to get that up and running. I wouldn't expect every student uh, to suddenly be able to start doing this, um, but still a pretty cool example. All right, so getting back to where are we at? Uh, we talked about that pre-industrial era where most what humans did was just physical labor. Then the industrial revolution, we really changed over to mental labor. I'm um, using our brains is what I'm talking about um, to do our work. Um, not that that means that everyone stopped doing all physical labor. That's obviously not true, but a majority. Um, and then to define, I guess, now the AI and digital era, we're at the stage now where a lot of that mental brain power thinking stuff can be done by machines as well. So it makes sense that this would seem like and feels like quite potentially a big shift. It's not going to happen um, all today, tomorrow, um, but it's going to happen faster than the previous revolutions um, and in sort of a 5, 10, 15 year period, I guess, uh, is what I'm talking about. Um, so this could mean that humans move to a different kind of labour as our primary form of work and also that mass education will shift somehow this is this is how i would answer those but i think that humans will be able to move to a more what i'm calling editorial relational collaborative type of labor as our primary form of work and that mass education is going to be able to evolve to support that shift um, and, and just a really quick summary for me what that means is me as a teacher uh, if the ai tools can help set up a lot of the lesson planning and the marking and reduce a lot of that workload it means I will be much freer to build the relationships with the students, to do the encouraging, to do the mentor, to be human, basically, to be human together. Um, that's really my fingers crossed hope, I guess, uh, for this era. And then, obviously, yeah, fellow educators uh, and the education system moving and evolving to support that shift would be fantastic. And that that's a, one of my key, I guess, takeaways that I've kind of found so far in examining all this is the idea of yeah like what job is more important now is it that author that it's me every word was mine that I came up with independently uh, or is it that role being the editor collecting collating combining um, is that more important um, and that that little tweet quote there actually comes from a 12 year old um, who was um, putting some thoughts together and I went you know what that actually summarizes it up really really well so we could say that, yep, tech won't replace us, but those who work with tech well will displace those uh, who don't. All right, so uh, a little bit more definition stuff because um, I've been in a lot of AI sessions where people say chat GPT, GPT this, et cetera, uh, and no one actually ever says what, what the G, the P, and the T stand for. And I got, um, I got an image generation tool inside of Bing to create an image for generative pre-trained transformer. Um, so that's the image that it depicted kind of of itself, I guess. Uh, so that's what GPT stands for. Yep, generative. This is the idea that this type of AI, it, this, the content doesn't necessarily exist in its final form until you've put in that prompt. Then it will create that response for you. So it's generating that on command. Uh, it's pre-trained, so tested on those large language models and it's a transformer it's really just taking that existing text that it's been trained on and then repurposing it based on your prompt um, is that intelligence um, obviously it's been coded and to do exactly that program to do give us this response 
Um, and the intelligence parts comes in where actually it's making active choices on what to put into that generated content. So uh, that's why we're classifying it as that. All right, so really, really quick, a lot of this you will know already. Um, what are the different forms of generative AI? What kind of content is being generated? So you've got chat and text from something like ChatGPT or Bard, um, where it's very much text-based, although they're starting to add in the ability to add in images, et cetera, as well. Uh, chat bots is an, another yep, pretty, pretty common form. Uh, instead of typing it in, you type it in, you'll get back a little bit more personal interface, I guess, for that sort of text. Uh, image and video creation, and you see a few of mine. I've got an image there that I put in about uh, teachers in a, a PD session about AI, and that was the image uh, that it generated. Um, but of course, integration into many of the tools that we already use, like Search and Office and Docs and Canva, um, that's sort of the, I guess, the biggest thing where instead of just having to separately go out and find an image tool or chat GPT, et cetera, set separately, it's all being uh, integrated into the tools. And that's a really interesting one in terms of discussion for schools. Once it's added into Microsoft Teams and many of the, the tools that we use at schools, um, we can't really avoid that. So it's worthwhile quickly talking about some of the issues, et cetera, as well. Um, so I know there are many restrictions. So in a lot of places, um, even states here in Australia, um, ChatGPT was initially just blocked. That kind of makes sense in some ways, especially while we were sorting out the age limits that <laughs> were required by these tools. Um, but look, there's a lot been a lack of PD potentially as well. I know the start of the year here in Australia for our schools, which is in January, uh, ChatGP had been available for a short amount of time. Teachers are going back to teach for the year. Um, students were about to start using these tools as well. Um, when do you find the time and how do you do that, that PD to bring everyone? And not just the teachers, but also the IT load um, as they have to figure these things out. Um, and of course, we probably want some restrictions if student data is being used to train that AI. Um, now, if there's inaccuracies, uh, we don't want to just go overboard with the hype about, well, <laughs> obviously, there's a lot of amazing tools here, but uh, uh, until recently, and unless you're using plugins, most of these tools, they don't have any knowledge prior to about 2021. They do hallucinate. That's the word for when they make stuff up. It could be that they tell you there was a book uh, that was written on a topic by a certain author and that doesn't exist. That kind of thing does happen. So you need to check and you can't always predict that content. And yep, the, there's biases based on the training data. And then lastly, uh, yeah, the services do go down sometimes. That classic where you prepare the lesson, <laughs> you go to use a tool and, oh, guess what? It's not working today. Um, so you have to be prepared for that. Uh, there's a detection battle of can you, can you tell if something's been written and student has submitted an assignment? Um, and even if, you know, those tools get accurate enough, there are other tools that students can feed their result through again just to re-anonymize it, uh, et cetera. Um, at some point, we're all going to have to pay probably a lot more for some of these tools. I'm sure that once we get hooked on them, there's a, a bit of a, a business model there. And look, even just the ethics that there are moderation workers out there um, and you're being paid very small, small amounts. Now, uh, there's some things that we can do to think about this. So as far as the restrictions go, positive might be, hey, actually, that's fine. Um, it's blocked or there are restrictions. It might be giving us more time to actually learn about it. Um, if it's inaccurate, uh, and some of those issues, well, that's fine. Let's just use it for starter prompts only for smaller uh, introductory type tasks. Um, let's not pretend, you know, think that it's 100% uh, accurate. We can rely on it all the time. Uh, and as far as some of the other issues, as I said there, um, this is actually a fascinating to, to, to be talking about ethics. Um, and uh, it, can, it can be a lot of good discussions, uh, started discussions that actually come out of that. All right, guys, so uh, I want to move on to the integration side of things. Having looked at where have we kind of been, where are we at with all this now? Um, so yeah, my current role after being in education for 23 years uh, I have worked with STEM punks and STEM punks obviously were doing STEM uh, workshops of all different kinds, uh, but we like to bring that punk, that questioning kind of attitude uh, as well to what we do. And part of that is not is the fact that we don't just do STEM, uh, but we integrate that with a design thinking. So we have a STEM journey and pretty much all of our classes and even the innovation sports competitions that we run, uh, we see students go through all the steps of the design thinking. Sometimes, you know, only like a 45 minute round of that innovation sports, 
they do all of these. Sometimes it's across a week uh, of challenges. Um, but you're probably familiar with design thinking, um, starting with that empathize and exploring a new topic. And look, that's the same as what you do in a classroom when you introduce a new topic to students ahead of their assessment. Uh, we kind of all do that. We don't always have time to, spend, to do as much of that exploring with students as we would like, but we start there. Um, you know, then I've got to define, okay, well, what is, what is the assessment? Um, my early draft could be the ideating, prototyping is actually getting, you know, an assignment together, evaluating what you hope that's happening and then iterating to get their final one. Uh, even a, a classic kind of assessment structure, you often are actually following a lot of these steps. And so we find it super useful to use these, but fle really flesh them out in that design um, sense. And so here's a, a sample, I guess, question that we use. Um, which is something like, what do humans need to be happy and healthy living on Mars? This is one of the sort of sample challenges we use in some of our workshops. And we would then spend a bunch of time yeah, exploring firstly things like, well, we humans are going to be happy and healthy on Mars. What's the gravity like? What's the uh, atmosphere like? What will living, you know, what will their needs be? What do humans even need for starters? There's a lot of uh, stuff you can do there. Uh, and then obviously start working through to prototyping solutions, et cetera, as, as we do um, with STEM punks. Now, if that's our, I guess, our process, and then along come all these AI tools. And as I spoke earlier about that learning goal, I can use this now as the way that I determine, oh, okay, well, I might use that tool and that tool. I don't need to just sort of be overwhelmed by all of them. So that brings us back to here's some suggested tools and I found it really, really useful. I had an amazing response in sharing this um, over the last few weeks of, yep, let's use design thinking as the framework of where we would plug tools in. So here's a bunch that I definitely recommend. I want to try and um, show you a couple of these in a second and explain why I plug them in where I do. But I'm sort of thinking, okay, early days of AI in the classroom. Um, there's still issues in a lot of the schools I work in around students having accounts and registering and using any of this. I don't want to necessarily go there as yet, but a lot of these work really well, even just with me as the teacher, kind of at the front or getting students up to, to do it with me or for me in front of their peers. Um, and where we just have this up on the screen and these tools are led uh, by the teacher. So down in that early empathize stage, um, summarize.tech is great for summarizing full sort of articles and websites, et cetera, into much shorter forms for students. Hello History app, we're going to look at in a second as a way of interviewing historical figures that might be um, part of the topic you're introducing. Uh, the Byte chatbot from Codebreaker. I know Brett Salak has mentioned that earlier in the week. I can give another shout out, shout out to that. So rather than chat GPT with all the registration and stuff involved, uh, Byte, if you just Google and search for that, uh, that will let you just use the tool. It's just on their web page. Students can type in there without their student data being saved. Uh, anything like that. So that's actually one that I definitely recommend. And then as you move around through the different phases of design thinking, uh, there are a few other tools there that you can plug in. So koala.com, <laughs> love the name, um, is all about yep, brainstorming some text like stories, sort of story specific kind of ideas. Um, Canva, as many of you know, would be great at that prototyping phase when you're wanting to actually start getting a presentation and ideas in place. Um, and Scribble Diffusion is great for turning sketches into um, actual drawings, sort of more um, professional drawings as part of that prototyping type stage. Chat GPT, well, it's, it's always going to be useful at many of these uh, stages. And actually at that evaluating stage, getting it to uh, have a look at what um, you've written, <laughs> or as you can see under the, the teachers uh, over the side here where we talk about, well, what are the best things that teachers can use these tools for? Um, using chat GPT, that evaluate stage to help uh, with your marking um, and, and getting uh, feedback ready for students. And there's another tool there, validatorai.com, uh, which validates and looks at business plans and ideas and will give you sort of very specific feedback around that. So that's really one thing I'd love you to take away um, from my talk today as well, is this idea of, yeah, yeah, let's lose design thinking. Now I'm using this as a part of the STEM programs that we do, but use design thinking as that framework for plugging the tools into. So we can go one step further 
Uh, and I love the idea of the SAMR letter, the S-A-M-R, um, where we look at, we get a new tool, we just substitute it in, is the first thing we do, but then we learn it a bit more and we can augment the task. Then the task gets modified by what the technology allows, and then we can actually completely redefine our task by taking our use of that tool uh, even further. So if I quickly show you the Hello History app. Now I've used this, as you can see there, to have students in some of our space lessons talk about, talk to, sorry, Neil Armstrong. But there are many other historical figures, etc., that they can look for. You can do a search on there as well um, to find all kinds of historical figures. Uh, and what we did with Neil Armstrong was wanted to find out about the moon. We were actually exploring, doing a, a STEM lessons around the moon, etc., and uh, we wanted him to help us out. Uh, now, in terms of substitution, yep, if we're just starting off, boom, what we might do is just say, hey, what was it like at the moon? Substitution level, very simple question. Instead of going to Google, I might type that into the Hello History chat app. But I can go further. I can actually record all the previous chats. Um, it's not just a one and done. Uh, so students are then able to actually go back and compare different answers, etc. And I would love at the modification level, the next thing you might sort of step up to is having students compare the responses that they get and, and finding errors. And we did manage to get the, our Neil Armstrong bot to make an error about the moon. And students were very excited about they actually achieved that. Um, but that's also obviously teaching them to check for errors and that, you know, sometimes the AI is infallible. Uh, and then if you have time, students could actually move on to a whole other level of making their own chatbot with a tool like Character AI. So here we are. This is our empathize stage. We're like, yep, let's use Hello History to help get our heads around the key historical figures that are part of this new topic that we're studying. But yeah, Hello History, you can actually go through that SAMR uh, levels as well. Um, if we move all the way around to the prototype stage, we can also use an app I would recommend called Blockade Labs, uh, Skybox. And this is a tool that lets you create images, right? So we've talked about some of those already, like Mid Journey and even in Bing Chat. Uh, but Blockade Labs will let you create a 360 degree image. Uh, and that sort of opens up a whole lot of other possibilities. Let's see if I can type something in here, if it's going to work for us live. Uh, if I'm just going to do week of AI. <laughs> Normally you would put type in something that was much more specific, obviously to the topic, but I could choose from all these different styles. I'm just going to go with the digital painting. Oh, there's a green progress bar. That's a good sign. And we'll see what does it think for that. But once we've generated this 360 degree image, it's going to be much larger than most of the image generators make, which is one reason I recommend it. Many of your others will give you a little square image, uh, whereas the Skybox tool here, it'll give you a, yep, that much bigger image. So students, especially wanting to fill out the backgrounds, um, might be for slides, but we'll talk about uh, co-spaces being an option as well. All right, so now we've got the, you know what? I'm, I think you will get the idea. Even if we just have a look at this background one here, you can see the kind of image that Skybox can create. Sorry, we didn't get to see that week of AI one. Uh, but much larger image opens up a lot more potential for uh, the students creating. Now, uh, substitution, we could just type in a basic prompt and get, and we want a desert scene like that. So we just saw, we'd get that. Uh, but if we're moving through that SAMR ladder again, uh, we can, at this prototyping stage, we could augment what they're doing because they could actually create a whole bunch of multiple images and then go through a process of selection, like which is best, which actually meets um, whatever solution we're prototyping. Uh, let's make multiple images with Skybox and then see which ones are best. Uh, at the modification level, stepping up even more, i am actually be getting the students comparing those responses to, again, to find errors. So I went through a whole process with Skybox trying to get it to make Mars bases. Um, fairly accurately, and it, it kept giving me blue skies, for instance, um, kept giving me multiple planets in the sky. Um, so then I had to develop my prompts a lot further to try and eliminate some of those. 
Um, and that also teaches me about the process of what works and what doesn't, you know, what is it capable of, what are the limits? Um, so that's sort of that modification level. But of course, once you've got your really good image that actually works well for the solution that you're trying to prototype, yep, go ahead and use that to make uh, other content and, and co-spaces. If you haven't heard of CoSpaces EDU, fantastic, easy to use tool for schools. We can actually take that 360 degree image, pop it inside CoSpaces, uh, and then students are dragging, dropping, and building inside that actual environment. Um, so that's a little, I guess, again, that's sort of in the way that we do things at STEM punks. Uh, a little look at, yep, we work around that design thinking. We use it as a framework to plug tools in. And I actually personally love that SAMA model just for keeping me honest that I'm moving through more sophisticated uh, methods, I guess. Right, so uh, I would love to keep in touch with everyone. You've got my Twitter at JNXYZ, let's say it like that, um, but also my email there. Uh, I said, love to keep in touch around these topics. And if you're doing design thinking and plugging these in, you might make, if you make your own design thinking framework and then have extra, you know, what tools would you plug in? Would love to see that. Um, and thanks again to Teach Thank Gold you. with I R Amanda. It's been awesome. Yeah. No, it has been. I actually, um, I took the design thinking framework and used um, the Freytag story arc and used it to kind of like to do lesson design and how lesson design should be written like a good story. I, mm -hmm. I love, I love the way you you integrated AI into it. And I think, I think we could even layer all of those kind of together and. That's that's what good lessons do is they they tell stories they bring students mm, into definitely. them and they become part of the fabric of that of that lesson. Yeah. yeah. And hello history dot AI is like one of my f oh it's so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Could, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I'd love to see what other people are. like. Those are the ones I've come across and I think plug in be fascinating to uh, see what everyone else are thinking as well. But yeah, thanks to everyone who tuned in. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Amanda and Erica. Nice catching up with you guys. Well, you too. Likewise. That was amazing. Likewise. All right, my, my, I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. I had to restructure <laughs> things. <laughs> Are you design thinking? I am <laughs> design thinking on a Friday, which is not easy to do. But he, that was a, that was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. So for is it fr Friday afternoon, Friday morning still for you guys? For me, it's. it's well, both of us, it's evening. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, evening. Ooh, Thomas and there's one to go. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I better let you get to that, and then I hope you get to celebrate afterwards and also <laughs> relax a bit and enjoy, like, what has been an amazing, successful week that you guys put together. Oh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. No, we couldn't, We again, we couldn't do this without, you know, you, the amazing presenters, um, sharing what you know and, and bringing your wisdom and knowledge of how you're using AI, your thoughts on AI ethics, and um, just the tools that are out there. So thank you again every, to every single one of our presenters. Thank you to Elena and Brad behind the scenes who are yes. moderating the chat right now um, and have done a, a lot of the, uh, the background work. So of, of putting this event together, we appreciate you. Um, yes. Elena says, thank you. Francis says, thank you. Um, nice. Francis, where was Francis from? Oh, I can't remember. I can't either. It was, it's not, not the U.S. <laughs> All right. I've seen, no, I've seen no, good, uh, lots of countries here. It's been very cool. Very Absolutely. Cool. Well, we have one more session to go. One more. We're, one more. And then <laughs> um, we will be giving away our, the prizes. We've got our random wheel picker. That we've got single copies of the AI classroom to give away. We've got the class uh, or the school set of 30, 30 books um, and a free hour of PD. The U.K. That's right. Sheffield. Mm -hmm. Sheffield. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Trisha, and um, and and more. Uh, so, looking forward to that, and very much so this next session. Six ways to use AI uh, with elementary. Was it with elementary students or, or just students in general? I think students in oh, general. Tanya, you're going to miss this one. You're excused. It's Friday. Go have fun. Yeah. Catch us on the replay. Ah, Christina, yeah. you're going to love Christina. She's she's always a, a knowledge full of knowledge and always take away things from her sessions. She's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, enjoy the rest of your day. Do something fun. Um, and, and shoot us, shoot us some photos. He's got a cyberpunk jacket. Cyber jacket. This guy is legit. Yes, he is <laughs> legit. All right. So 
We will see you in our mission again. Go grab your cocktail coker sandwich or your cheese. I got my cheese. Can't see the cheese its but the cheese its are here. Uh, we'll we'll see you in a minute.